Good morning, Friday. And yeah, this week seems like it's been a really long week. It's gone really slowly for me. I don't know why, but I am glad it's Friday and I've nothing planned this weekend, but it'll just be really nice to, to chill out and just kind of potter at home. But I'm finishing the week off and I'm really excited to be talking to today's guest. Um, I'm a huge fan of the TV programme Back in Time for Tea. I love social history. I love um, learning. We can learn so much about watching programmes like this. And Leslie Ellis is definitely a woman of my own heart. She's a real, she's got a real sense of adventure and she's got her own podcast now. So I'm going to be catching up with Leslie Ellis to find out more. So good morning, Leslie. Hi, Rachel. It's lovely to connect with you on here. Another social media um, connection that actually I met to you through Trudy, my friend Trudy Fielding gave me your connections, um, which is really good with so many like-minded women, isn't there out there? It is, and in actual fact, there's a bit more of a backstory to this because back in probably pre-COVID days, but only just, I met with another mutual friend, Mandy Taylor, uh, and Mandy said to me, you need to collect with Rachel Peru. I went, brilliant. do I? She went, absolutely. And then I noticed that you and Trudy were friends and there you go, yeah. it's meant to be. <laughs> we, we were talking before we came on, on, on air about the fact that there does this seem to be this real sense of community now for like-minded women that are going through midlife and getting out there and taking on new adventures, which is lovely, isn't it? It is, it's great, it is great. So we've got lots to talk about because there's so many different things I want to talk to you about. But let's start back with your experience of Back in Time for Tea on the television. Um, so for those that didn't watch it, you, you can go back and watch it on Catch Up, I think, still. But it's how many different decades did you do? We started in 1918 and we worked our way right through the rest of the 20th century up to 1999. So we did right. most of the 20th century. I mean, it's amazing. and I, I love the programme. Were you immediately up for it as soon as you saw it or did, did you take a bit of persuading to go for it? Well, when I, um, I'm a massive fan of the show. So I've watched all the episodes, all the previous series. And when I saw this little advert pop up on Facebook, I thought, oh, I can do, we could do that. I'd love to do that. So I sent off a little form forgot about it. A few days later, I got a reply back saying, we're really interested, send us a picture. So I sent them a picture and I said to the kids, do you know what I've done? <laughs> Told the kids and they went, oh yeah, yeah, we love that program. Yeah, let's do it, it'd be a laugh. So I did that, thinking nothing of it. And then a few days later, I got a call saying, oh, we, we really liked your application. Would it be possible for us to speak to you and your husband over the phone? Because we've got a process that we're taking all the applicants through. And I thought, I'm going to have to tell him what I've done. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't told him at that point. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I've not told him. But Johnny he is used to me. He just rolled his eyes. I'm like, what have you got me into now kind of thing. <laughs> and, um, yeah, we went from there. <laughs> so it was me that really, really wanted to take part in it and I'm not I think because I'd seen the previous series and I knew that they were gentle I knew it wasn't you know I knew I, I wasn't going to be putting my family through ridicule yeah although we did create you know our own sense of ridicule but that was fine um but it was a really gentle program and we were more than happy to do it the kids did get cold feet towards the end particularly Caitlin the eldest um, but you know, she went ahead. We did it, and we all enjoyed it. She, she'd still deny it now, but she did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and looking back, she'll have that to, those special memories as a family as well. What a fantastic thing to do together! Oh, it really was. It really was. And, and when your children are teenagers, you kind of um, you're separate because they're in their room. You're mm -hmm. here. You're it, and we had to we were all living in this really close quarters with no access to technology so all we had for the full period was each other and mm. Johnny and I thought that were great the kids not so much but we loved <laughs> it what I found really interesting as well like from a woman's perspective is you've gone through all those you've experienced those those different decades and how differently women particularly older women have changed in society which which period of time did you find the most difficult um, surprisingly, the 60s I found the most mm. difficult. And I think I was looking forward to the 60s because my parents were teenagers. They talk the music, they talked about how fantastic it was. And we know all about this sex, drugs, and rock and roll going on. But 
in all honesty, it missed northern middle-aged women because <laughs> I, the teenagers suddenly, on the previous eras, we were all in the same situation. We all worked. Our money all went into the family pot. Mm -hmm. The girls had to the girls had to help with the housework harvey didn't and and johnny didn't which were a bit odd um yeah the girls were not happy about that when <laughs> harvey didn't watch tv and eat sweets and they had to cook dinner <laughs> <laughs> um but i think in the 60s everybody else's lives moved on so suddenly you've got this kind of thriving teenager kind of teenage culture where the kids are going off to cafes and out for chinese takeaways johnny was working he was a minor um he was in a brass band he was off to watch the football at the pub i just was left i was left I think they deliberately engineered it that way for the program. Mm. Uh, each episode took eight days to film, and we were caught. We were in there no matter mm. what. Um, we had no other alternative. We had no money, no car, no phones, no mm. music, no access to anything other than what was available in that era. So I literally sat on my own. The crew were out filming with everybody else. I just knitted, listened to 60s music on the beautiful radiogram that we had and um, sort of tried to maintain the beehive the best that I could <laughs> and make scones. There was nothing else for me to do and I felt really, really miserable. Mm. I just felt invisible in the 60s. Yeah. And what's, what was your favourite decade then? My favourite was the 70s. And I think I did say about to talk about this on the program, but in the 60s, the hair. So it was mm. pinned back in this, you know, I slept like a pencil with a, a hairnet on because there were no way I could recreate that. For eight days, I kept that in. <laughs> um, and in the 70s, it was all the Farrah Fawcett flicks. And I felt that the hair was a really good metaphor for how the 70s kind of opened up for women. It was the mm. start of... Um, women being being able to be more independent i'd got a job in the 70s um i just felt it was more fun it was freer mm -hmm. and i think that was the start and of course i was born in 1971 yeah. so it was the first era that i lived through for a second time and the nostalgia it, it was wonderful we all loved the 70s actually yeah i must admit that was my favorite program because so i'm a 1970 birth and, and that, that was my favorite decade so growing up i think it's got really special memories so when i watched that decade i was like yes i really like this one yeah yeah it was wonderful what did you learn about from yourself? Did you learn something from, you know, something new about yourself going through that whole process? Or did it change the way you thought about women's role in society more? I think, yeah, yeah I think that's probably more like it. I did, what I did discover about myself is that I really enjoyed not having to make any decisions. So, mm. um sometimes as women we have to we make decisions all the time especially as mums mm -hmm. you're making decisions not only about yourself and what you're going to be doing but you're making decisions about what your children are doing where they're going who they're yeah. hanging out with where they're going you know you, you constantly you you i mean i'm the one who books the holidays and 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 suddenly you're in this situation where you don't make any decisions at all, not even the underwear that you're wearing mm. or the jewellery because that's all decided, the colour mm. of lipstick that you're wearing. Somebody else has made that decision. They decide when you're getting up, what you're going to be doing, and you've no idea until it happens. And I found that extremely liberating, just letting mm. go of any control whatsoever. Um, and I guess I suppose I um, realised that maybe I'm more controlling than I thought I was and I just I just felt liberated from needing to make decisions I think I think that was kind of what I learned about myself yeah uh, what I learned about women's roles I think was that um we were really manipulated I think what we did do was miss the Second World War period because it's been done before. So we finished the first episode in 1939 and started the second episode post-war in 1945. Mm -hmm. But I think during the war, women basically ran the country. 
They yeah. kept the wheels of industry turning. And what I felt was this huge government propaganda in the 50s to put women back in the box. Mm. And I found it sinister. It was sinister. Mm. We were um, all, you've got to bear in mind that we were only surrounded by 50s magazines, 50s literature, 50s newspapers. And every article was about being perfect for your man mm -hmm. it was about being beautiful when he came home from work making sure that you were clean and tidy and looking pretty and that you'd refresh your lipstick that the food was on the table and women had gone from basically running the country to being expected to be almost like some sort of stepford wife yeah uh, and it was it was government-led propaganda uh, mm. and, and I think that's probably what I learned and found most distasteful. Yeah, and of no. course, a generation of women grew up in the 50s thinking that that was how to be a woman, to be perfect, to yeah. have a tiny waist, to look beautiful. And I do think that a lot of today's problems and issues mm. are an echo of what happened in the 50s. Yeah, yeah. because I think it's so ingrained in society yeah. from those years it takes a long time to get rid of those doesn't it in society it does, it does. we're like the second generation our yeah. children are the third generation from that level of propaganda mm -hmm. and i hope that you know us as second generational women from that have helped to turn that tide yeah. i certainly feel the weight of the responsibility of that more than perhaps i did before i did the program that's interesting so let's now fast forward to 2020 and talk about the podcast so tell us all about what inspired you to set up the podcast Okay, well, really, it was Back in Time for Tea that inspired me to sell the podcast because um, having having had this unique experience of living as a middle-aged woman through so many decades and mm -hmm. seeing that transitional change, it made me realise just how very, very lucky we are to be born right now in yeah. the present, you know, and and to to be middle-aged in in the 21st century because uh, we now have opportunities beyond the wildest dreams of our parents and certainly our grandparents we can go where we want we can travel where we want we can apply for higher purchase if we want which was mm. something that we couldn't do even in the 70s yeah. we couldn't have a mortgage i mean you know um so i think i i was really inspired by the freedom that we now experience and um about three years ago i joined a cycling club an all-female cycling mm. club called the queensbury queens of the mountain oh i love that <laughs> yeah, yeah and um I, I suddenly i'm surrounded by these women like me men i think the average age of our club is 50. so we've got we've got people in there in the late teens early 20s we've got people in there in the club in the 70s but the average age i think is 50. and so i'm surrounded by all these women who just inspire me every day mm. they're going on adventures they're doing things i've never thought to do and we we're going open water swimming in in lakes all over yorkshire and yeah just they, they, they inspire me to be more adventurous mm -hmm. and um, I wanted to share some of their stories I wanted to share the stories of my friends who are out there doing interesting things having my I seem to have this this and you'll relate to this Rachel I'm sure but I have loads of friends who've had these career epiphanies in the middle age mm -hmm. and they're completely like doing a, a 360 and yeah stopping what yeah. they're doing they're doing something that they've always wanted to do or trying yeah. something new and um yeah it's it's a great time it is and i think society and the media don't often reflect what's actually going on in reality with midlife women uh, because we don't hear these stories so the fact that there are so many different podcasts with sharing these stories is just fantastic because it gets that message out there and it does have a knock-on effect if you see one woman that's changed her career and is doing something that's really inspired you it does give you that inner sense of well if she's done it then maybe i could have a look at what i can do and i think yeah. it's having a knock-on effect with so many people 
I agree. I think before I did the podcast, I did a bit of research about um, middle-aged women, and we are the largest demographic in the country. So there are more women our age than any other demographic. Yeah. And we um, we're massively underrepresented in the general media. You mm. don't see pictures of middle-aged women in magazines very often. Yeah. You're a great exception to that. And I absolutely love seeing those pictures that you post, Rachel. Thank you. I really, really do. They are massively inspiring. But you don't see us on TV adverts. We're not on billboards. Mm. We're not even represented in um, TV programmes. And, and it's just the missing yeah. trick, aren't they, really? Yeah, they really are. Yeah. These middle-aged women generally have more money than younger women because yeah. they've established themselves. I don't understand it, really. Yeah, no, I think I think there are changes being made, but I think we've got a long, long way to go and it's not quick enough for my liking at all. Yeah, absolutely. But you are like a trailblazer for that, and that's brilliant. Thank you. I know you've got a real sense of adventure, which is what I'm drawn to. I'm drawn to women that have got this sense of adventure and that take on new challenges. So what have you got planned next? Because I'm sure you've got other things in the pipeline that you're dying to do. Uh, well, I've just booked a holiday, a cycling holiday across the south coast of Thailand. With, oh, wow. That'll be yeah, amazing. With 11 other women. About wow. my age. <laughs> uh, and I'm so excited about that. But that's going to be in 2022. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I COVID has sort of put a stop to a lot of adventures. Yeah. Um, last year, I cycled the coast to coast. So we went from Markham to Bridlington over three mm. days, which was fantastic. And um, the year before that, so I took up cycling at the end of 2017, just more or less after we finished filming. And because I'm an impulsive person, I signed up to do the Joe Cox Way in July, sort of in June, about two weeks before or something ridiculous. And I'd never cycled that far ever. And it was 280 miles to London. That's a, that's a long cycle. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it was it was fantastic. And um, yeah, How long did it take you to do that? four and a half days wow that's a lot of miles each day isn't it yeah it was but you know there were a lot of miles but a lot of smiles camaraderie a couple of tears a very mm. sore backside yeah, I bet. <laughs> but it was one of the the greatest things I've ever done it was mm. just and suddenly I thought if I can do this I think this opens up a whole new world to me yeah uh, you know, I, I'm yeah. hoping that I'm next year that I might be able to cycle from Vienna to Budapest oh, uh, on with some friends. Uh, that opportunity has just popped up this last couple of days, so mm. I'm hoping to sign up for that. I've got some open water swims planned. Mm. Um, I love doing that. I, that's something I've really enjoyed during lockdown because we live cl really close to the river, and that has been my sanity, really, because it's just been so nice to switch off, and it's really good for your mind to just... Once you get past the cold water, it's really good for you, isn't it? It is. And I was listening to, I think it was a, oh, it was, um, I get migraines, really bad migraines. I was listening to a podcast by Dr. Rupi, and he was talking to two doctors from the Migraine Trust. And they were saying that actual open water swimming has a positive effect on uh, pain management. Oh, right. That's interesting. I don't know whether it's yeah. just the cold floods, you know, floods all those receptors and so you can't feel the pain anymore. But it is interesting. Yeah. I think there's some research going on about open water swimming and the impact that it has physically and mentally. Yeah. Well, I hope one day we can actually connect in person. Maybe you may know I might be able to get on a bike ride with you or something. It'd be lovely to do that, that next be year. Brilliant. Yeah, that'd be really good fun. So how can people find you? How can people find your podcast? How can people find out about you? Okay, so my podcast is on um, iTunes and uh, it's Podbean as well. So you can go on the Podbean. And what's it and called? It's, it's called the Midlife Manifesto podcast. Great name. Yeah, uh, I'm on Facebook. So if you search for the Midlife Manifesto podcast, you'll find my Facebook page there. And I also have an Instagram account, which is 
honestly, I don't use it that much. I think it's Lel32 or Leslie32. Leslie32. Is it? I'll put, <laughs> I'll put all the links at the end as well so people can find it. Thank nice. you. I love Facebook, but I, I just, I sometimes get so, uh, I, it's like going down a rabbit hole with social mm -hmm. media and I don't get anything done. Yeah. You know, I'm an adventure kind of girl. I, yeah. if, I, if I get too embroiled in Instagram as well as Facebook, I've no time for all adventure. <laughs> yeah, no, I keep doing it. And I love doing what, I love being able to talk to you and connect with you. It's been lovely, Leslie. So keep it doing really what you're doing. Has. And I can't wait to see what you get up to next. Thank you so much for having me, Rachel. I've really enjoyed Pleasure. it. Enjoy your weekend. And you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Well, what a great way to end the week and that's really inspiring and yeah it definitely makes you want to talk to people like this just makes me want to do more and try and ex explore more and see what else i can achieve so um you never know i might just uh, rust off my bike and join leslie next year sometime once all this covid settled down so i hope you've had a really good um week and i hope you enjoy your weekend and i will i'm having a week off next week because i'm going to be doing a lot more work on the book next week but then i've got a uh inspiring week of women the following week so back soon